Hi, good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the executive director of FAN, a nonprofit that presents programming exploring human development across the lifespan. I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Professor Heather Cox Richardson and Professor Claire Bond Potter. Thanks for joining us tonight. Our YouTube channel has an archive of nearly 300 videos of past events, so be sure to subscribe to the channel to get updates when new recordings are posted. And now for some introductions. Heather Cox Richardson is professor of history at Boston College and an expert on American political and economic history. She is the co-editor of We're History, a web magazine of popular history and the author of Letters from an American, a nightly newsletter chronicling current events available on Substack with over 2 million readers. My guess is that might number might not even be correct anymore. She is also a co-host of the Vox podcast, Now and Then. Claire Bond Potter is Professor of History Emeritus at the New School for Social Research in New York City and the author of The Political Junkie Substack and an associated podcast, Why Now? Her most recent book is Political Junkies, From Talk Radio to Twitter, How Alternative Media Hooked Us on Politics and Broke Our Democracy. Whew, great conversation tonight. Let's welcome Professor Heather Cox Richardson and Professor Claire Bond Potter. Hi, Heather. It's nice it to is. see you. It is such a pleasure. This is going to be so much fun. I know it is. And, you know, I thought we would start, and this sort of takes us into some history territory, but I bet a lot of the people who read you every day don't actually know what historians normally do and why we are different from many other historians. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about how you decided to use history as a tool to fight for democracy? So that's a really great question. And I actually would like to hear your answer to that as well. Um, but the, the first thing you say, I think is a really important distinction to make because sometimes people mistake me for a journalist. And I'm always really quick to say, listen, journalism is an incredibly important and an incredibly difficult profession, but it is not my profession. So what journalists do is they look for the story. They look to see what happened and they will tell you what is happening. But what historians do is they study how and why why societies change. So we look at what histo what journalists do and we say, oh, we see these stories and we, we put them into a larger picture of how this is changing our society. And those are actually two incredibly different skill sets because, you know, we have to learn theories. We have to learn how theories are built. We have to learn how things work together. And we have to figure out how we think about them. So I did not ever set out to do what I do in the letters or in this book. The, that was really more about my teaching skills, that people started asking me questions about what was happening during the Trump administration, especially in the lead up to the first impeachment when Trump was caught making that phone call to Volodymyr Zelensky asking for a quid pro quo before he would hand over the money that Congress had appropriated to mm -hmm. help uh, Ukraine pay off uh, or, or, or pay its military to fight off Russia. And just sort of explaining who was who and how the law worked and all that. And sooner, you know, you know, as I'm writing that stuff, pretty soon it turned into, well, but, but this is like when Andrew Johnson did that, or this is like, and pretty soon a style was born and it is, I think, reflective of that larger picture of, you know, historians saying here's a larger pattern, but it has also now evolved to become the history of this particular moment. So I get all the time letters from people saying, advertise my book. You know, I do the same kind of stuff you do. Your readers would like to know about my book. And I'm like, I can do that on Twitter for you. I can do it in, you know, different places, but I can't put it in the letters any more than, you know, a, a civil war diarist would have said, oh, here's my friend's book you should read. So, um, so that's, that's actually what's going on there. But what do you think about it, you know, about where historians fit in the present moment? Well, I mean, as you know, I started um, as a blogger in 2006, and literally my second post was the day after the 2006 election when Nancy Pelosi became Speaker of the House. And so I remember that second post and saying, you know, never in my lifetime did I think I would see a woman become Speaker of the House. Um, and it was sort of this moment that made me realize that I had a role to talk back to an audience that was larger than my students. But it was also true that back in blogging days, and you may have found this at the beginning of your letters, I didn't actually know who the audience was or where they were. 
Um, and the audience kind of came to me and I was going back and forth with them. One of the things that I was able to do early on was talk about the politics of higher education because the attacks on higher education that we're seeing today really began first under Ronald Reagan, <laughs> then under George W. Bush. I mean, they really intensified um, all the culture war stuff that happened in the 1990s. So by the time we got into 2006, 2008, um, the attacks on higher education and the beginnings of what would become the Tea Party were starting to emerge. So much like you, as a historian, I was kind of picking up the evidence around me and fitting the puzzle pieces together and saying, this is what it means. And this is where it's coming from. I think one of the things and I'd be really interested to hear what you have to say about this is people started calling me a public intellectual. And it it's a kind of antiquated term for what I do. Um, do you feel like a public intellectual? Well, we need to unpack what that is, but I just want to okay. clarify one thing. You said you began as a as a blogger, but yeah. you already had a doctorate, so you were already yeah. a college professor. So that's correct. That's a little bit like you you sort of said, "Oh, I'm going to start blogging," and then the rest came later. But you were already a very well known scholar at the time. Well, if if I could also add to that, one of the things our audience may not know is that academic publishing is excruciatingly slow, and so if you really have something to say and you want to say it now. Um, these sort of instant blogging platforms that emerged in the early 2000s were really a godsend. Um, WordPress and Blogger um, and LiveJournal was one for a while that people were using. Um, and so it was a real antidote to the kind of seriousness and slowness and vetted quality of what we did as scholars to be able to say, here's my idea. What do you think about it? I mean, it's it's something that scholars mostly don't do. Um, so, so do you want to unpack the public intellectual thing? Oh, or so the public, the public intellectual thing, you know, it like you say, it's an antiquated term. But one of the things that you know, you and I have talked about in the past is that right now, both the the world we came from, academia and journalism, is changing so incredibly rapidly that one of the things that has surprised me is, you know, I don't hear that much about being a public intellectual because I just, mm -hmm. that's that, you know, your audience had to come to you. I went to my audience mm -hmm. and they think of me more, I think, as a friend and as somebody who's, you know, willing to talk about this stuff than as a professor that they have discovered. And um, at least that's my impression. But one of the things that really jumps out to me is the degree to which a number of us have simply done an end run around the gatekeepers. And, you know, how many times were we told, you can't do that. It can't be done. This isn't the way. And, and finally, right. how many times did you hear that and then say, well, okay, I'll do it my way and end up, you know, ended up with huge audiences or very popular books or any number of things that couldn't be done until we did them. And that's, um, I think, what's really interesting about this moment, because right. as people are getting less and less trusting of certain um, legacy media, right. and I'm not going to call out any specific newspapers, but there are certainly some out there we have to look a little bit askance at, the people that I read religiously are not in major newspapers. Right. They're, they're people who have done an end run and they have very large followings either on in in print or, uh, you know, on pixels or in videos. And there, you know, could you see like Trey, whatever his name is, being in The New York Times? No, but he makes right. a lot of sense. And you want right. to listen to that. So there's a where this all settles. I don't have any idea, but there is no doubt that we have been lucky to take advantage or, or maybe we're forced to it. I mean, it's also not an accident that a lot of us are right. women, yeah. you know, and have gone around, had to go around the gatekeepers because that was just where our audience and where we, where we could be heard. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, you know, just sort of going back to something you said about gatekeeping and elites and so on, you know, it's it's one of the themes of my book, Political Junkies, that everything that, every technology that is used for good is also used for evil. And so I think, you know, we're, I don't consider either one of us populists in any sense of the word, um, but that sense that, you know, all of the authorities are wrong and you have to seek out alternative forms of information has also gotten this nation into a lot of trouble. And you talk about that in Democracy Awakening 
Um, so I wonder what you think about how we balance the gatekeeping, you know, do we need some kind of gatekeeping? And if so, what kind of gatekeeping do we need? Well, so, so yes, I actually do think of myself as a populist in many ways, but okay. as a 19th century populist, and that answers your question in the sense that when the Alliance summer happened in 1890, the East did not see it coming. You know, President Benjamin Harrison did not see that there were a whole bunch of really disaffected Westerners who were living under a drought and who, you know, couldn't get their crops to market if they even had crops and so on. He simply didn't see it. And a number of the Westerners and the Southerners as well looked at the political system the way it was in the United States at the end of the 1880s and the beginning of the 1890s and said, the problem here, they had definite ideas about the, what the political problem was, but they said the real problem here is that farmers don't understand the facts. So they started all kinds of new newspapers. They had picnics. They had lectures where they explained to people just the facts. And, you know, then they did go on and have a political right. uh, piece of their uh, of their picnics where they said, and so we should vote for people who don't want to do these things. But they talked about what the tariffs did to how much money people made and how expensive tin was and tin mattered because you had to have a, a tin pail to put your lunch in and you had to have tin pails for the cows and all that sort of thing. And I think about that moment as being very similar to this, where we have had a series of political um, leaders who are really entrenched in a system that on one side, at least, no longer reflects reality. And that, I think, answers the question about gatekeepers. What I try and do and what I think our best writers are doing right now is simply saying, here are the facts. You know, you do with them what you want, right. but if you want to understand what's happening in, for example, the Trump, uh, the many Trump legal cases, here are the facts. Here's what the law is. Here's the evidence we have. Here are the people who are testifying. Here's what we you know where things are, and that return to a basic fact-based reality. I think answers the question of who the gatekeepers should be. They're the people who are actually writing about facts, and that by the way, includes some people in the legacy media, but it throws out a lot of people in the legacy media as well. And that I think maybe is our answer that we are in a moment that looks much like the period of the 1890s when we in fact got a whole bunch of new media that focused on reality. You know, all the news that's fit to print as uh, the, the New York Times began to say in that era, as opposed to, you know, Abraham Lincoln, you know, eats babies or whatever, which was the earlier period. Right. Well, and and... We're, I'm going to move us back into the 21st century now. One of the ways that the internet can produce facts is by the wonderful invention of the hyperlink. Um, and, you know, you have all your hyperlinks at the bottom. One of the things I love about Letters from an American is it's it, it's basic quality. There are no illustrations. There's nothing to distract you from the text. And you want to run down everything there, you go to the links at the bottom. I embed my links. And I think, you know, one of the problems with this is we often assume that if those facts are made available to people, they will ingest them. Whereas people read so fast on the internet. I mean, if you look at if you look at your stats, one of the things you'll probably see is a lot of people stop reading partway through. The, you know, and so the question about what we're doing with with social media, which is so important. Um, also, we have to keep thinking about how to engage our readers, how to teach our readers to read, how to teach our readers to stick with it and fact check and take this knowledge and make use of it, right? Yeah, I am. I, I, I'm back here on the one statistic that always jumps out to me because I don't have a lot of time to look at the statistics are the number of people who open a link that I post. Uh -huh. And it's, I believe it's less than 1%. Right. Um, right. But they could, they could. And that's one of the reasons that I don't use hyperlinks is because I find them um, 
first of all, I get furious when people say something about, let's say, President George W. Bush, and you think that when you link to that, you're actually going to get to the story about PEPFAR or whatever he did. And instead, it's like Wikipedia's biography of George W. Bush. I'm like, that was a waste of my time. But um, but also, I find them enormous time sinks because you start down that rabbit hole. And then as somebody said, pretty soon, you're learning how to feed a giraffe, you know, (laughs) because you've gone from (laughs) one thing to another. But one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is, um, and I think people will be interested in this, is when we're talking about the internet and about how you tell what's real and everything that's out there, there was incredible news today out of uh, out of the White House. Right. And that is that the President of the United States and the Vice President Kamala Harris have initiated a series of, oh, it's a series of executive orders that dramatically changed the way the United States and therefore probably the rest of the globe will deal with artificial intelligence intelligence. And I am really excited about this. And since this is your Balawick, I would love to hear you tell people, first of all, what's in it, but second of all, how you think it's going to matter. Well, I think one of the most important things that's in it is that anything generated by AI has to identify itself as being generated by AI. Okay. So Um, so what if they don't do that? What if, what if, They don't. I mean, what do they do? Do they come hunt you down and kill you? Well, that's a really good question, because, of course, one of the aspects of the Internet is something called Section 230, which our listeners may or may not have heard of. But it was a law that was written um, at the birth of the Internet back in 1994-95 that said the that Internet providers could not be held accountable as publishers. Right. And that was intended to keep people from, you know, destroying companies um, as they were born. Um, But what that has meant is that you can do almost anything on the Internet without consequences. Now, if you pair that with the fact that there are, you know, billions of gigabytes (laughs) being generated every day, how exactly you police the Internet is another problem. Okay. So what would probably happen is I think we're going to get a new government agency. I hope actually it's an international agency. Um, The EU knows an awful lot about this. Um, Australia knows an awful lot about this. Um, So there are actually large agencies elsewhere that have started to figure out how to police the internet. Um, I don't know whether listeners know, but the EU is suing both Twitter and Facebook for the amount of misinformation that they have been publishing since October 7th. Imagine that happening in the United States, right? Um, So I think this is an effort um, of the Biden administration to get on top of something that is absolutely critical to democracy, which is the capacity to manufacture things that look factual. Um, I think the watermark question has been booted around for a while. It could be easily written into any AI program. And because of that, it could actually be checked if the government had to sign off on it before it was released so that AI programs would be like pharmaceuticals, that they would have to go through an agency. They'd have to be checked. You'd have to see how they worked. And I think one of the things that would be very different about this is that companies would have to say what it does before they release it. And that is the absolute opposite of what tech companies have done in the past. You know, Twitter, for example, did not begin as Twitter. And I I talk about this a little bit in my book. It began as something called Friendstalker. Okay, imagine that as a brand name. And with Friendstalker, it was simply written so that you could locate your friends on Saturday night, right? And it wasn't until a South by Southwest conference in 2006 that the participants figured out that they could actually do things with hashtags and so on to write a narrative of the conference they were at that people elsewhere could read, right? But Twitter never planned that. So by by actually creating these regulations, the federal government is saying, this is too dangerous, right? It's like inventing some kind of explosive and selling it in Walmart and seeing what people do with it, right? Um, so this is this is a reorientation of how we think about the internet as producing products and as creating an information ecosystem. Well, so doesn't it also um, affect privacy and the way that, that um, 
algorithms can use your choices on the internet, for example, to, to show you stuff that yes. infuriates you. I mean, that's yes. the surprise. I mean, that's the thing that I can't wait for is the yes. idea of not having our rate, you know, not having rage farms any longer. Right. Well, that that is absolutely correct. And that is something that was pioneered by the EU. Um, so so the EU actually already has those regulations around personal information and privacy, which is why if you go to any website um, that is that originates in Europe you actually have to check something off that you are going to allow them to collect information on you or not. And you can still use it if you don't. Whereas in the United States, if you don't allow them to collect information on you, basically the website doesn't function. Right. Um, so that that is a really big change. So that would theoretically go into place before the 2024 election in Correct. such a way that, I mean, that's, that's as we know, the yes. um, the Russians and a number of other places as well are already rage farming us. You know, yes. you can see it in, in our reactions to a whole bunch of current affairs where you're like, where is this even coming from? Right. But what about this? What about if um, one of the things that's really happened a lot lately is people are taking real footage from like Brazil in 2007 and saying this happened in France yesterday. Right. Would, would you have to identify that? Because that's real. You wouldn't you wouldn't have to have it watermarked. Well, that's that's not an AI problem. Um, that that is simply a problem of the Internet. Um, and it's a problem of Internet literacy. Um, and I would say two things. One is in response to this Biden executive order, you're going to see a whack and big lawsuit. Right. Um, and, you know, I think you document this in your book over and over again, Heather which is any time the government actually tries to do something um, that will make life better at the risk of um, it hemming in undemocratic activity, um, people on the right try and stop it, right? And so, so there will be a lawsuit. Um, I'm not sure that this will go into play before the 2024 election. I'd like to think that was true, but um, legal action could really hold that up in court for a very, very long time. I think the other thing is we have to start teaching internet literacy in school. And, you know, schools are in plenty of trouble right now. Um, teachers have more than they can handle. Um, curricular issues on basic things like math, science, and English are hanging fire. And yet, it is a basic feature of citizenship today to know what is on the internet. I mean, it's like when I was in high school, we used to read the newspaper, right? And we, you know, we would talk about the newspaper and our teachers would talk to us about how those articles, you know, what was the difference between an opinion piece and a reported piece? I don't think they do that in school anymore either. But you know, the internet is this funny mix of reporting and opinion and then garbage. Um, and, and to teach young people how to actually read it in such a way that they can make sense of what is what. And often it's very easy to figure out that this is from, you know, 2016 in Brazil, not yesterday in France. You don't have to work that hard, but most people don't work that hard. Um, and so I think we have to teach them to do that. Um, I, I do think that that young people are better with it than older people, actually. Yeah. And um, and somebody there is on Twitter who is showing people how to figure out where a, an image is from. I actually right. think it's really helpful because I'm good at words, but images, yep. I don't, I don't, I mean, images don't mean a lot to me anyway. So, you know, if I look at it, I'm like, I don't know where it's from. Yeah. But it's also true, Heather, that we're being barraged with content. And it's not just the internet. It's cable news. It is the junk mail that comes in to your mailbox every day. I mean, my mother gets probably 20 gimmies every day from politicians. She's on so many lists. And it's really important to remember that our internet systems exist alongside a whole range of early non-digital social media, like email, you know, mailing lists, um, pamphlets, newsletters, all of those things still exist off the internet too. And so um, I think we are, we are being barraged with too much information, um, a lot of which isn't true. And by the way, speaking of information, 
you, you're not a New Yorker, so you probably don't listen to 1010 Wins, but 1010 Wins has the most garbagey, um, fact-free commercials. Um, Rudy Giuliani advertises gold bars on 1010 Wins. So there's, there's this whole ecosystem of advertising fake shit that is also, you know, so, so I think, you know, as Americans, we need to start to think about how much information is coming at us and how we limit that um, and get to the things that are really important, like reading books, for example. Well, so let's hope that this will, um, that the that the AI material today will actually make that difference because I, it's a big deal. Yeah, yeah um, it is a big deal. This. But I want to ask you something about books because when I was reading your book, Heather, um, one of the things that struck me was the form. Um, and, you know, I do a lot of reviewing. I read a lot for my podcast. Why now? Yeah, and I'm sorry this wasn't longer. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I read very fast nowadays. But what I noticed about it is that the chapters were really short and tight. And it's almost like the chapters were kind of written for someone who gets their information from the internet. And I mean that in a good way. Um, and that you both you you kind of went back and forth, and historians don't normally do that. I mean, chronology is just drummed into us, and you sort of pick up themes, and then you say, "Okay, but let's go back a little bit and talk about this other thing," and then we move forward. And sometimes you'll hit the same thing again, but from a different angle, and then say, "Okay, let's look at another thing." So, how did you make a decision about how to write this book? So the book began as an attempt to answer the questions that people ask me every day, like mm -hmm. you know, how did the party switch sides? Um, what is a Southern strategy? How, what is in the Constitution? You know, the sort of basic questions. And what I realized pretty quickly was that the question that everybody asks every day is how did we get here? What does it mean to be where we are and how we get out? Right. So, so then I figured pretty quickly there was going to be three sections that did exactly that. Um, how did we get here? Where is here? And how do we get out away from here? And um, within that, though, I wanted everything to be readable in a really quick way. But I wanted each essay, there are 30 essays, so there's three sections, 10 chapters each. I wanted them to be standalone, so you could, if you wanted to, just read one of them or excerpt just one of them. Or they would also work together as a section, or it would work together as a book. And let me tell you, that is no small a uh, small goal to set out something that can be both a single essay and a larger essay. So I'm still not happy with the essay on the constitution yeah. because it, like you say, it, it, in that, in the, that's the last section of the book and it's designed to tell a whole story about how people created and expanded democracy. So to give people a blueprint without saying, here's a blueprint, but you know, while I'm talking about the Constitution, there's this little at the end of it, like, oh, and we can fix that. You know, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't really fit. Yeah. So it was a really, um, it, it was designed as a, it, you know, almost like layers. You know, you can read the whole thing just as what it is on its face. You can read it by essays. You can read it by sections. You can read it as a whole, mm -hmm. as a whole book. But then I realized um, after I did the first draft that it was also a story about how democracies lose their way and become authoritarian, mm -hmm. become um, authoritarian countries, uh, yeah. give you know, give way to a dictator, and that centers on the use of language and history. So mm -hmm. there's a whole theoretical level too that people can read it on that talks about the the different ways in which an authoritarian. Um, a rising authoritarian uses language and then how in the middle section, how that language has created a disaffected population that can then be welded into a movement largely through street violence. And then finally, in the final section, an attempt to reclaim both language and a different kind of history to combat that. So it's actually a pretty complicated book, I think, for all that I hope it looks like I just rolled out of bed and wrote it, which is always my goal. I want people to think I'm not working at all um, because I think it reads a lot easier. But in order to make it easy, look easy, you got to work really hard at it. Yeah. And my sister um, sent in a question um, asking both of us if writing on the Internet has actually changed our book writing. And I would say absolutely it's changed mine. What would you say? How so? Um, I think I'm a better writer. 
Um, I can't take for granted that my readers know anything about what I'm writing about. So I have to take the time to explain in concise ways. Um, I had to drop a lot of the formalisms that are drummed into us in graduate school. Um, I started writing in shorter paragraphs. I started um, using my sense of humor in the ways we were talking earlier about the classroom. Um, I used to I used to use my sense of humor in the classroom all the time to just sort of grab their attention and then pivot to what I really wanted them to know in that minute. Um, so so that that has changed everything. It's also when you write on the internet, you have to know that something bad could happen. You, you write a book that is double blind reviewed and published by a university press. And in general, nothing really bad happens if you've done your work right. But you can do your work right on the internet and people go after you. And I think we both experienced that. So I would say all the same, except, um, uh, the I found that people went after me on the internet, whether I wrote anything or not. So I might as well go ahead and write. I mean, they came after me to on to me before I went yeah. putting anything out there. Um, so so the the thing that I find interesting though is yes, I'm a much better writer. I mean, at this point, I've written millions of words. Um, but there is an, an immediacy to it that I find, first of all, I love writing letters. I've always loved, my mother wrote letters, I write letters, um, and I, I love that there is a, there's a shortness to it, whereas the, when you try and write a book, that book's going to be around forever. Yeah. Yep. So, so for example, you said a book's generally there isn't a problem. There are four major errors in Democracy Awakening that literally keep me up at night. And I know how they got there. I cut a paragraph in one, in one, there's one, Abraham Lincoln is um, either shot or it dies on the wrong day in Democracy. I saw that, yeah. <laughs> yes, because I had him getting shot and then I had him dying and then I cut the middle of the paragraph and nobody caught it. And it's yep. like, that makes you crazy, right. right? And there's, I've got, well, never mind. The writer always knows where all the errors are, right? There's right. two capital Ds that were supposed to be small Ds. Right. That's by a copy editor. And that haunts you in a way that like, you know, every once in a while I will do something stupid in a letter, letters from an American. Um, and, you know, I'll put something the wrong date or do something. And of course I hear about that the next day in a really big way, but it's ephemeral, you know, I can right. correct it. And then by the next day, people are onto something else. And right. so you, you're like, okay, so go ahead and scream at me all day today. And I'll deal with that. But tomorrow we'll start again. And when a book has an error in it, you can't start again. Yep. So it, it almost feels not only in the writing, but also in the, in the personal relationship you have with your readers. Like if I write a postcard to my son and I, I misspell his employer, or I say, I hope you had a great time at the golf tournament when he'd really been to a baseball tournament or something, he's not going to hold it against me. Right. That feels much more like the relationship you have on the internet with somebody because yeah, there's some people who hold everything against you, right. but for most the for most people who aren't trying to do everything as a gotcha moment, there's it feels much more personal because it's so mm -hmm. so give and takey. Yeah, yeah. No, I I agree with you, and I think um, one of the things that I learned from internet writing was to write really fast because, oh. like you, I had a full time teaching job. And when I first started blogging, I would get up at five o'clock in the morning and knock out my blog post and then be in the car going to work by eight o'clock. And so I had, I had to get that thousand words done in three hours. And it was what it was. Um, I also, and you're sort of alluding to this, I got used to putting out things that were imperfect. Um, anybody who reads my Substack knows that I'm a horrible proofreader. Um, I have to credit my sister with something else, which is she told me to start reading the posts backwards. Um, she said, you know, there's something about your brain that actually corrects things right. as you go along if you're just reading it. So if you read it backwards, your brain can't do that. You're actually tricking your brain. Um, but I mean, those imperfections are there and I go in and I fix them there. And as you're, you're saying, it's ephemeral. Um, let me ask you something else, Heather. I mean, you write so much what are you, what are you reading 
So um, that, that's a funny question in that I'm trying to catch up on a lot of history that I have not read. A lot of people here are probably going to want to read, um, I've just read it, um, The Tyranny of the Minority by um, Dan Ziblatt and mm -hmm. Steve Levinsky. Levitsky. Um, so there, I'm reading history as well and trying to read straight history. I'm actually trying to do some research for a new book. But you know what? I I read young adult novels for fun. And I was in a bookstore the other day. Actually, I was signing books for this. And um, Lana, you were there. And um, I said sort of generically, oh, there are so many great books here that I would love to read. And this young man who was there working in the bookstore said, oh, you have to read this. And he takes it off the shelf. And it's The Art Thief. And I'm like, oh, I really don't care about reading another book's a story about an art thief. Could not put it down, right. could not put it down, read it like it was candy, like the whole thing through. And the other thing that I'm reading right now that I absolutely love, did not see this one coming, it's Tom Hanks's new book. Really? I would never in a million years have picked up fiction by Tom Hanks. Somebody gave it to me and it is, his characterizations remind me of Larry McMurtry who wrote Lonesome Dove mm -hmm. and The Last Picture Show and all that, where you have incredibly well-constructed characters that you care about, but you don't feel emotionally manipulated by. Mm -hmm. And and I um I I I both of them um I shouldn't I shouldn't have actually said that because both of them are going to be basically my holiday gift list this year. <laughs> so <laughs> if anybody is looking for good, I mean I don't I don't I don't think either one of them is going to change society, but they're both phenomenal reads. But somebody did ask, what do I read in terms of the people who I do and who do are doing an end run around the gatekeepers? And, you know, I'm thinking of people like Joyce White Vance, people like Brian Klopp, mm -hmm. people, and, and I don't necessarily read their sub stacks, although I try. I love uh, Jill Lawrence from The Bulwark. I read The Bulwark. I read, um, it doesn't mean you agree with everything, but it means they're smart people who make you think. So I read, um, I always read Tom Nichols, even though I usually disagree with him. I always read, um, uh, David Rothkopf on foreign affairs, bunch of foreign, I'm reading a bunch of foreign affairs people now um, because I'm trying to get up to speed on foreign affairs. Uh, who do I read in politics? Um, today's, po you know, I don't read a lot of, of theorists on, on American politics because that's kind of my field and I know so much of it so well right now. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm trying to think, who else? Uh, I read a lot of lawyers. I read um, a Lawfare. Um, I read, um, crap, there's Lawfare, I two think of them at the same time, one's about, um, another one about national security, and I can't remember what it is. I read Defense, the Defense Department. Um, you know, what I'm looking for are people who really know their field and have their credentials that you know they know their field, yep. that, that just explain things to you. And I don't, I love to hear what people's opinions are. That doesn't mean I agree with their opinions, but I find that really interesting, especially in fields I don't know terribly well. So that's where I would go with that. What do you, th who do you read, Claire? Um, gosh, well, best historical novel I have read recently is Karen Ann Fowler's Booth. Have you read it? Mm -mm. Okay, so, so fans of Democracy Awakening would love Booth because it's about John Wilkes Booth. Um, Lincoln's assassin, but it's not really about him. It's about the family he grew up in. In other words, how did this guy who ended up assassinating the greatest president of the 19th century, perhaps, um, how, how did he end up doing that? Where did he come from? And of course, he's the son of an actor um, and the whole family are actors, except for the women who aren't allowed to do anything. Um, but it's it's just a beautiful story. I read a lot of historical fiction so that I can work on my writing. How are people telling stories? Um, I read a lot of biographies now because I'm writing a biography of Susan Brown Miller. And I have to say about half of them are terrible. And it's really caused me to think a lot about biography, which was one of the first genres that I read as a young person that sort of steered me toward history because I get very involved with people's lives and telling the story of a life as a way, as a window into history is really important. Um, but a lot of them aren't very good. And so thinking about what makes a good biography, how do you capture someone's imagination when you're writing about one person? I read the bulwark too. 
Um, I actually like those guys and I, I do agree with them a lot of the time. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, I think they were very brave um, and they, they kind of set themselves up um, to, you know, really be the target of, of a bunch of lethal maniacs on the right. And they've done excellent work. Um, I read a guy named Ryan Jodowski, um, who writes something called the National Populist Newsletter, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, he's very right wing. He also reads polls better than anyone I know. Tom and, Bonnier. Really? Oh, that's who you want for polls. He's great. Okay. okay. Um, so, so I read people who can teach me things. Um, and then I also read a lot of things that I wouldn't ordinarily read because of the podcast. Um, every author who comes on my show, I read their book from beginning to end, which they always comment on because they've been on other podcasts where the person has clearly not read their book at all. Um, so um, Jennifer Frost's recent book about uh, youth voting, the 26th Amendment that allowed 18 year olds to vote, it's a real window into yeah. an aspect of the civil rights movement nobody talks about. Um, that, that was a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, ah, yeah, I'm reading all the time. Which is, and writing is why I read young adult novels because if they can't use violence and they can't use sex, yes. they have, to have incredibly good plot lines yes. and very well-developed characters. Um, just for you, just for the record here on a, a great and little known biography, the 1934 Pulitzer Prize winning biography, um, and I, I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember now who wrote it and I should be able to, of John Hay, who was Lincoln's, one of his secretaries and he becomes Secretary of State. And he, I mean, he's, and he's, he writes a famous novel and he marries a, the daughter of a robber baron. I mean, he's kind of everywhere. Yeah. And that biography is incredibly well-written and just an incredibly genius biography because his ultimate argument is that basically the guy was a nice guy mm -hmm. and I read it and I'm like really that you can't come out and say he did all these things because he was a you know right. baby and then I thought well why not you know that's right. somebody I said that to somebody and he goes well that's basically my plan and it's like every time they needed to fill out you know, an expedition to wherever they'd be like, Hey, let's call John. And anytime they needed to have another person sitting at dinner, they'd say, Hey, let's call John. And, you know, and, and I thought that was, you know, cause usually you're looking for, Oh, he wanted to change society or, Oh, he was rich and had these right. and they're like, no, he was just a good guy to hang out with. And I right. thought that was such a daring approach to a biography. I loved it. Carl, I think it's Carl Van Doren who okay. wrote it. it was, okay. it's just, it's totally fun. It's on YouTube or on, um, anyway, uh, you know, the, uh, the, Google Books um, for okay. free. Okay, I am I am like not attributing this to the fact that you're a 19th century historian, but rather that you have so many people in your mind all the time. I have to tell you that I was on MSNBC a few years ago because I'd had a, a piece in the New York Times that really took off. So everybody had me on television. And Andrea Mitchell asked me a question and I started talking about William McKinley because it made sense to me. And when I got out of the room, I looked at my phone and my partner had texted me, William McKinley, WTF. And, <laughs> um, so, and when I went home, she's like, you do not start talking about William McKinley when you're on Andrea Mitchell. <laughs> but I love it that you do that, Heather. So I wanna ask you another question. Um, which is, you say right at the beginning of the book, and it's really, really arresting, and it allows the reader to follow this for the next 290 pages or whatever, 230 pages. You say there are all of these forces trying to shut down democracy throughout American history, and it is marginalized people who are the goad to making democracy bigger, better, and more open. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think it's something people need to hear right now. Okay, so I, I will, but because we are both academic historians here, and this gives us an opportunity that I don't always have elsewhere, this is the real earth-shaking part of this book, I think, mm -hmm. that it attempts to reject the 1776 project as authoritarian history, the idea that there's a perfect past somewhere back there, and we can get to it as long as a strong man follows a certain set of laws that you know are written in stone and we don't have any say over them, is a very authoritarian form of history. But at the same time, I feel like there has been a problem 
with, I mean, I think there are a lot of problems with the 1619 Project, not least the lack of recognition of the enslavement of indigenous Americans before the enslavement of black Americans, which is, you know, right. the, this is the way it was, right? Um, but But there's also this sort of sense that the democracy never gets it right. So how do you bring those two things together? And what happened was after I'd written a draft of this manuscript and thrown it aside for a few months, and I went back to it, what really jumped out to me was that what brought those two visions together and really put a different spin on them was to say that the reason the United States has been a successful democracy and the way that it has, that that the, the racial, the gender, the class tensions in our society have contributed to that democracy are because marginalized Americans have always held up the Declaration of Independence to say, you know, these are great principles, but what about us? And because they have constantly kept that in front of people, constantly talked about it, they were able to expand democracy periodically to include more and more people. So yeah. it's almost a, it's an, it's a, an attempt to revision history to say that this is democratic history, small d democratic history. And it's not written in the past that everything was perfect in the past. The framers didn't have all the answers at all. But what they did was they gave us a set of principles that are by their own definition always expanding so long as people who are not included in them can hold them up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's a really hopeful message, but I also think it's smart. Do you have a take on it? Uh, well, I do think it's smart. And as you were talking, I was actually thinking about one of my favorite endings of a book ever, which is Glenda Gilmore's Gender and Jim Crow which book, just terrible title. A wonderful book. And, you know, for listeners who haven't read it, it's about what happens to black elites in North Carolina as they get the vote, as they build a society, as they recreate a Republican party that represents their interest, and then how that gets shut down first by violence and then by a whole set of laws that we now know as Jim Crow laws, right? And so that the number of black men who can vote becomes infinitesimal in North Carolina. Editors will always tell you, don't end a book in this really depressing way. You have to give the reader something to be hopeful about. So what does Glenda do in that last chapter, the 19th Amendment passes that allows women to vote and black women show up to register to vote? after the 19th. And it, I, I mean, I'm feel, I have chills just, just thinking about it now. Um, and, you know, I think what you're saying about democracy is that there's always somebody who has a new idea about how to create freedom and how to make another space for freedom. Um, sometimes the internet is that space. Um, it's become very vexed right now, but sometimes the streets are that space. Sometimes the classroom is that space. Um, I have a friend who is um, teaching at the University of Afghanistan. Um, it's the American University of Afghanistan, which is currently living somewhere in Pakistan or something like that. But all of his students are women who are taking online classes in their homes in Afghanistan. They're women who wow. were kicked out of university by the Taliban and somebody reorganized the university and put it online so that these women could keep studying and keep working. And so, you know, that's that's the part about democracy that makes me hopeful, which is human beings. Human beings know what to do when their freedom is taken away. And it doesn't mean they win quickly. And it doesn't mean they, um, you know, they always succeed. It doesn't mean it doesn't take a long time. Um, but human beings know what to do. They find a place to create freedom every time it's shut down. Well, and that is, I think, what gives me hope as well. People ask me every day what gives me hope for democracy. And, and am I hopeful? Because, you know, again, many terrible things seem to be happening in the world, and they certainly are. I won't deny that. But there, I have two responses to that. And the first is, you know, tell me when terrible things weren't happening. 
mm-hmm. because, you know, there was never a perfect day in the past. And I think about that a lot when I think about, you know, I, I, I'd like to have a good night's sleep and not have to worry about everything I do every day. Right. But, you know, I bet my mother thought the same thing when she signed up to fight World War II, you know? Right. So, um, so there isn't a perfect past. Things are not always great. But the other thing is there are a lot of good things that are happening too that just don't really get a lot of press. Right. I mean, it was just a dramatic win today by the UAW. Yeah. Or, um, I mean, a really dramatic win for workers, which is huge for the UAW workers, but it's also huge for the concept that workers should have bargaining rights and should be able to actually push back against the extraordinary um, concentration of wealth at the very top of our society that began in 1981. So there's good stuff happening out there, too. Yeah. So, but what really I think gives me hope for democracy is we're talking, we've talked so much about artificial intelligence and about the internet and about going around gatekeepers and all that. And one of the things that truly has jumped out to me as I have been out on the road with this book is the size of the the communities that have built like this. I mean, that have built through, I mean, you know, when Joanne and I did that podcast together, everyone thought we'd been friends forever. No, we met over the internet, basically. I mean, we'd shaken hands before at some conference, but um, but we we met doing this and we did the podcast doing this. I think we did it right. once in person and and all of the people I write to every night, I don't know in person, I write to them over the internet. And there are millions of us who right. now are creating this community that says, wait a minute, we want our democracy back. Right. And the that idea, I think that people believe in democracy. They believe in the concepts that people have a right to have a say in their government and they have a right to be treated equally before the law. The idea that we need a government that responds to the needs of the American people, I think is is something we're not going to walk away from. But more than that, when we talk about how to figure out whom to follow when you're reading, what we are doing is reestablishing the project of the enlightenment. I think the idea that we are operating in a fact-based reality and that at the end of the day is about our right as human beings to be treated, to, to be able to have access to facts, because if you don't have access to facts, you can't make good decisions. And, you know, if you're, if you're trying to run a business with somebody and he's embezzling everything and you don't know it, you can't make good decisions about your business. If we present the facts and if we create a fact-based society, that doesn't mean we're going to agree, but it does mean that we are embracing the ideas of the enlightenment, that we have a right to a fact-based reality, and we will make decisions based on those facts. And at the end of the day, I think that is about human self-determination and that people will not voluntarily walk away from their right to determine their own futures. Even if everything looks terrible, even if we lose rights here and maybe gain a few here, but lose more over here, at the end of the day, we'll be like those women in Afghanistan who say, okay, I can't go to university anymore. At least for now, I'm going to do it online. So I am actually, you know, I think you said you were more hopeful than you'd been in forever. And I sort of feel the same way because, you know, when we talked about this stuff 15 years ago, nobody was paying any attention and they sure weren't having us on TV to talk about William McKinley. Yep. Um, so I, I feel like, like we're in a, in a better place than we have been in terms of the number of people behind us and who are willing to be part of this project, keeping um, keeping democracy alive and talking to people about what that means. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, so here's Lonnie. Um, I think she's going to shut us down, Heather, but I'll see you in oh, five yeah. minutes or so. Okay, let's let's I'm not trying to shut you down. Of course. I'm just <laughs> looking okay. at my clock. I mean, I would never such a brilliant conversation between two <laughs> clearly very informed folks. Um, it's been fascinating listening. Um, Heather, I do appreciate it. It's not often that we get our special featured guests who um, express genuine curiosity as to the thoughts and opinions of their interview partner. So I appreciate that very much. Uh, many times they're just receiving and answering questions and answering questions. And I, I appreciate the respectfulness with which you are uh, engaging in this conversation. So thank you so much for that for tonight. 
Uh, I'm going to pivot. I'm going to remind folks of a couple things. One, uh, we've been posting links in chat all along about how to come to After Hours. After Hours is a Zoom meeting. You can ask your own questions. It's lively. It's fun. Both Heather and Claire will be there. Um, all we're seeking is a donation in your discretionary amount. Come and hang out with us at After Hours. So thing one. Thing two, uh, we are going to be doing, I'll take a look at the Zoom attendance report tomorrow morning, probably not when I get home tonight, but tomorrow morning I'll run the report, and then we're going to give away 300 copies of the book. Um, there are more than 300 people on the Zoom, so in case you're thinking, oh, I, I have a good chance, you have a solid chance, um, but you don't have a perfect chance, so I don't want you to be disappointed if every single person doesn't get a book, but we, we are going to give away a lot of them. And we're thrilled to do so. Uh, so I'm going to ask one question here um, that we received uh, because we are at 758. So we're going to do this quick, Heather. So the question is from Ahmed in Oak Park, and he's wondering, what can we the people do to preserve our democratic values in the midst of special interest groups, politicians, and wealthy individuals that exploit loopholes to gain the system? So there's the obvious, you know, give money to causes you care about, vote, um, et cetera. But what I always tell people, because I believe that ideas change society, is to take up oxygen. That is, call everybody who has any role in your government from the, the local dog catcher through to the, the Senate. And more than that, even, although that's incredibly important, um, talk to people. You know, we know political scientists will tell you that Say talking to somebody about your beliefs will change their beliefs and make them more likely to change their vote than any other thing we can do. So that actually really matters. And if you don't think it matters, think about the fact that Clarence Thomas has recused himself for the first time from a January 6th case because he got so much blowback from the fact that his wife was involved and he was not recusing himself. And the fact that the Republicans who were sort of screaming about how excited they were about their um, their anti-abortion legislation have started to, to try and change their, their language and say that they're not they're not actually trying to stop abortion. They're really trying to, you know, to to hide what they're doing, to do it in the middle of the night instead of doing it out in front of the public, because the public blowback has been so extraordinary and the voting blowback has been so extraordinary. They recognize that it's a non-starter. So simply taking up oxygen when, in fact, communities like FAN is huge. My community is millions of people. You know, Claire's community is big. We're a lot of people and we need to recognize that we are in fact a majority, more than 80% of us want common sense gun safety laws. And of course, it's not getting through Congress because a small minority can filibuster those laws. It's important to remember that we're a majority and let that be known. Okay. And on that note, we're at eight o'clock. Thank you so much, Professor Richardson, Professor Potter. I look forward to seeing you. you have a five minute break. I resent both of you, your after hour Zoom link. So look for them in your inboxes. Thank you everybody for coming. Come hang out. We're going to have a great time. Thank you so much. 